I have always said that one of the great joys of doing what I do, of being an apologist, has been able to put my faith to the test, to put it through the fire over and over and over. When I began debating over about 20 years ago now, I recall that at one particular point in my life, I found a great interest in doing apologetics, defending historicity of the resurrection, the bodily ascension, the Gospels. And I recall, at the time, uh, I was primarily debating Protestants. I eventually began doing a lot of debates for a, a Protestant ministry, believe it or not, Protestant-run. Uh, the owner of the ministry was Augustin Astacio, near and dear brother of mine. And it was an outreach to people that needed to learn the doctrine of the Trinity. And I began heavily debating atheists, prominent figures like Dan Barker, John Loftus, Dr. Price. And one of the things that Loftus, Price, even Crossley, and all of these top names will put forth is the argument that, number one, you can't trust the Bible, and you can't trust the early church fathers either. They will try to point to all kinds of errors the early fathers made. Indeed, I did an event with Dr. Price, I believe, two years ago. It was a patron-only event, so it never aired to the public, where we dialogued and we debated the reliability of the early church fathers. I hope to do that again, hopefully in maybe a month or two with him. But you will find very often that atheism will attack not only the Bible, but the earliest followers of our Lord. They'll attack Ignatius, St. Ignatius, Bishop Polycarp, and they will tell you that you cannot rely on the writings. Now, Every time I've debated against atheists, my faith has come through after being tested and put to the fire. It's come through shining and more powerful than ever. And I want to tell you that I think you're in for a treat today. Because very often we hear that there are contradictions in the writings of the early fathers. One particular one, we're told in the letter, the epistle of Barnabas, that there's a contradiction on the bodily ascension of our Lord. You're going to want to tune in for this.
our study in the Epistle of Barnabas, an apostolic era church writing, <clears throat> will focus in chapter 15 above and beyond all the other chapters. And indeed, one of the contentions that we hear is that, well, you know, you can't even really trust the early church fathers. They're all over the map. You can't trust them in terms of historicity, in terms of the doctrine that they're passing on, passing down, that you really don't even know who the authors are. A, a bevy of arguments that very often you're going to hear from our Protestant interlocutors. You'll hear it also from liberals, from atheists. And one particular argument will highlight chapter 15, the Epistle of Barnabas. You can find it online to read <clears throat> for free. It usually has to do with towards the end of the chapter. Let's go ahead and read. We're going to read this for context. And by the way, you're wondering, you've got guys like Dominic Crossan, Robert Price, John Loftus, and many other atheists that will claim the early church fathers are not reliable sources. And very likely, you're going to find a lot of liberals pointing to this chapter. Rightly so, we've done a lot of work in terms of scholarship, conservative and liberal. So the issue's been brought up throughout, throughout the past 40, 50 years, quite a bit of times. <clears throat> we'll, be, we'll begin reading. Then we shall be able to sanctify it, having been first sanctified ourselves. Further, he says to them, your new moons and your Sabbath, I cannot endure. You perceive how he speaks. Your present Sabbaths are not acceptable to me. But that is which I have made, namely this, when giving rest to all things, I shall make a beginning of the eighth day. That is a beginning of another world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day, which of course would be Sunday. We keep the eighth day with joyfulness. The day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. And when he had manifested himself, he ascended into the heavens. So the argument goes like this, and you're going to hear it brought up quite often. The argument will go along these lines. Okay, well, the Epistle of Barnabas simply is a problematic text if you're going to try to point to it as an early attestation to the bodily resurrection, to the death of Christ and the bodily resurrection and the ascension, because clearly it lays out that the ascension occurred on the same day same day as the resurrection. Now, a number of problems are going to arise from this, but first off, there are a number of ways that this is tackled. First off, some people are going to object. They're going to say, first off, this is clearly referring to the same day. And if that is the case, then when Acts 1 clearly is was not being held to, they didn't hold Acts 1, which teaches that there were 40 days that Christ remained before he bodily ascended to heaven. So there's a big problem right there from the outset. But number one, some are going to say, well, the text is clear. Christ rose again from the dead. Then he was seen and he ascended. It all happened on the same day. But then some others are going to say, okay, well, even if it didn't happen on the same day, we're being taught here that the eighth day is kept because that's also the day where he rose from the dead, and also where he ascended. So even if even if you want to bypass the issue of it being the same day that all of this occurs, you still run into a problem with the 40 days because it is still being taught that he ascended on a Sunday, which of course would interfere with the theology of 40 days, either which way. So there are a number of ways in which those that aim to attack the veracity of the apostolic fathers or any of the early fathers will interpret this either which way. But many of them simply say, well, look, it's very clearly referring to all of this occurring in the same day. He doesn't give any attestation to any post-resurrection events. Rather, the Epistle of Barnabas was just ignorant to this. How can you be hearkening to the reliability of apostolic fathers or even early church fathers, if they could get such important for Christians today, such details that are vitally important, wrong. 
uh, how can you know you can trust any of the attestation, either in the epistles of uh, to the uh, to the Philippians from uh, Bishop Polycarp, any of the seven Ignatian epistles, or any of the epistle of Diognetus, or any of them? How can you trust any of them? It, it does raise a red flag if this particular reading is the correct reading. We first want to deal with the dating of the epistle of Barnabas. J. Curry states on the dating of Barnabas in the Anchor Bible Dictionary that since Barnabas 16.3 refers to the destruction of the temple, the epistle of Barnabas must be written after 70 CE, must be written before its undisputable use in St. Clement of Alexandria, who was writing in the 100s. Since 16.4 expects the temple to be rebuilt, it was most likely written before Hadrian built a Roman temple on the site, circa 135. Attempts to use 4, 4 to 5, and 16, 1 to 5 to specify the time of origin more exactly have not won wide agreement. It is important to remember that traditions of varying ages have been incorporated into this work. So J. Curry Treat, clearly it's an apostolic era writing, was finished before St. Clement of Alexandria utilized it in his writings. Now, with that being said, I think it'd be helpful to look at many translations of Barnabas 15.9 and to really point out that it really does seem unfair to try and make two arguments. Number one, the argument that all of this had to have occurred in the same day or that the author is even arguing that on the eighth day, on a Sunday, the ascension must have also have, have, have had to have occurred. Barnabas 15.9 is just really clear. He goes on to say, Wherefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing, in the which also Jesus rose from the dead. So it's very clear. Christ rose on a Sunday. He rose from the dead on a Sunday. That's the way J.B. Lightfoot is, in, is clearly translating the Greek. But notice how J.B. Lightfoot, a mega scholar, goes onward to show Wherefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing, in the which also Jesus rose from the dead, and having been manifested, ascended into the heavens. So very clearly, the reading that all of this must have occurred in the same day, first off, let's eliminate the idea of it having to have been in a Sunday. That's nowhere even remotely implied there. Clearly, the resurrection is on a Sunday, but the ascension, that is not... Uh, pigeonholed into that kind of interpretation. The, the, the resurrection is, we agree with that. But if you look at J.B. Lightfoot's rendering here, he's got Christ rising from the dead and having been manifested, ascended into the heavens. It doesn't necessitate that this must have occurred in the same day. In the very translation that J.B. Lightfoot has rendered here, it doesn't indicate that. And really... It seems to us that the liberal scholars trying to push that are trying to push that kind of a rendering of the Greek because they've got a particular agenda. That agenda is to discredit the apostolic church fathers. Charles Hull says, actually translates it as, remember, we're going through scholarly translations of the Epistle of Barnabas uh, Charles Hull's translation. Wherefore, we keep the eighth day as a day of gladness, on which also Jesus rose from the dead, and after he had appeared, ascended unto heaven. I mean, you, you don't have that pigeonhole there either. A strict idea that, that the Greek is being rendered into the English as, okay, he rose from the dead and he ascended the same day. No, rather we read, Jesus rose from the dead, and after he had appeared, he ascended in heaven. It doesn't indicate exactly when. It doesn't tell you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight days. Furthermore, you're going to have to postulate that the epistle of Barnabas, that the author, was ignorant of the book of Acts. Remember in Acts chapter 1, we've got the bodily ascension there. Keep that in mind, okay? Because we're going to return to that. And it really does seem to us that the author of the epistle of Barnabas was aware of the book of Acts. Being aware of the book of Acts, it would have been quite the gaffe, quite the mistake, quite the error if he would have argued for a resurrection and then an ascension on the very same day. Doesn't make any sense at all. Roberts Donaldson translation reads, wherefore also we keep the eighth day with joyfulness. 
the day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. And when he had manifested himself, he ascended into the heavens. This really does make the most sense for us. Even though the other translations are great, the Greek really does seem to indicate that he rose from the dead. And then you've got the conjunction chi. The conjunction chi doesn't always mean that it's a continuous kind of event that is occurring on the very same day or events on the very same day. Indeed, Robert Donaldson sees it, translates that Jesus rose again from the dead. Why does he do that? Because then it says, and when he had manifested himself, he ascended into the heavens. That seems to be the very best rendering of the Greek. It really does seem to us to be the best rendering of the Greek. And we look at the Greek right here. And again, you're going to get people trying to argue, make the argument that in the Greek, ha Jesus aneste ek nekron, that you're going to see, okay, well, this is talking about Christ rising from the dead, that this right here, the rising from the dead, then you've got the conjunction chi, then it must mean that all of this, that rising, and then the manifestation phanerothais phanerothais right here uh that the manifestation and the ascension into where into the uranus into the heavens that all of this is connected connected with what connected with the ha jesus aneste ek necron connected with the rising from the dead of christ no it doesn't necessitate that it doesn't necessitate that in the greek and we're going to read a scholarly layout in a moment to show that it doesn't necessitate that in the Greek. And this is an argument that you hear brought up today by those that attack the reliability of the testimony of the apostolic fathers. If you can say that they're not reliable, their testimony wasn't worthwhile to read, you can't trust their testimony, then what was preserved from Christ's uh, church that he founded? Were the original teachings and beliefs lost? It does create quite the issue, if you ask me. If you toss out the reliability of Barnabas, and then you've got all kinds of issues, such as problems with Bishop St. Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. What about the martyrdom of Polycarp? Very often bound up with the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, which records the martyrdom of the great Bishop St. Polycarp, the seven authentic epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. What about those? And we can go on and on, the epistle to Diognetes, and then we can attack the reliability of the texts of St. Justin the Martyr, of St. Irenaeus, newly minted and magnificent doctor of the church. But no, we don't agree with this particular kind of a reading. Now, we, we do want to look at this for a moment here. Uh, and then we're going to read something very clearly. First off, our position is very clear. Let me tell you what we think is the best reading. The best reading is the rendering of Robert Donaldson. He rose from the dead. When he had manifested himself, he then later ascended into the heavens. It doesn't tell you that this occurred in the same day. It doesn't. Furthermore, Barnabas, in chapter 7, very clearly is quoting from Acts chapter 14, Verse 22. Let's go ahead and look at this is Barnabas chapter 7. It is a type of Jesus set before the view of the church. They place the wool among the thorns that anyone who wishes to bear it away may find it necessary to suffer much because the thorn is formidable and thus obtain it only as a result of suffering. Thus also, says he, those who wish to behold me and lay hold of my kingdom must through tribulation and suffering obtain me. This is Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 7. Barnabas explicitly quotes from Acts 14, being aware of the book of Acts, unlike what liberal scholars postulate. Being aware of this book, he would have been aware of the 40 days Christ remained, thus why the New Advent translation has the translation that it has. Remember in Acts chapter 1, it begins with, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, ascended into heaven, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, unmistakable proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1 lays out the ascension occurs after 40 days. If Acts chapter 1 clearly teaches a bodily ascension after 40 days, and the Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 7, is quoting from Acts 14, you would have to make quite the ridiculous case that he would have only, what, had a fragment in chapter 14 only? And not been aware of any of the other chapters, such as Acts chapter 1? So he was well aware of the books of, at book of Acts chapter 14, that he not only quotes from it, seems to quote from it from memory, are you going to tell us he didn't, he wasn't aware of Acts chapter one? Which ancient, which of the best ancient texts exist that lack the ascension account in the book of Acts? And I would suggest you look at manuscript history and you're going to find that the answer is not one that will help the liberal case. It's clear. If Barnabas was aware of the book of Acts, particularly chapter 14, if he had that in his possession, he very clearly would have been aware of chapter 1 where it talked about the 40 days of Christ remaining before his ascension. No serious scholar is going to argue that that is a later interpolation. That would be patently ridiculous, as ridiculous as arguing that Barnabas is teaching that Christ died appeared and ascended all on the very same day, being on that very same Sunday. It would, inc it would be incredibly difficult to fathom such an error in the epistle of Barnabas. And one that really doesn't make any sense. Indeed, when we look at Barnabas, let's read chapter 7 again. It is a type of Jesus set before the view of the church. They place a wool among thorns that anyone who wishes to bear it away may find it necessary to suffer much because a thorn is formidable and thus obtain it only as a result of suffering. Thus also, says he, those who wish to behold me and lay hold of my kingdom must through tribulation and suffering obtain me. And then Acts 14.22 strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, it's very clear to us. All you got to do is look and compare. Look at the Greek of Barnabas 7. My kingdom must, through tribulation and suffering, obtain me. Barnabas 7, Acts 14, 23. Through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And if you look and you compare the Greek, very clearly you know Barnabas is quoting from and pointing his audience towards Acts chapter 14. And if you're going to argue that Barnabas was ignorant as to the 40 days that our Lord remained before he bodily ascended into heaven, then you're going to have quite the problem on your hands because Barnabas was aware of Acts chapter 14 clearly would have had the book of Acts in his possession, not merely only a piece of Acts 14. He was very well aware of the book of Acts, very well aware of it. And he would have been aware of that as well. We want to read a scholarly work, which you're going to find in the Benedictine Review, which will be very valuable in reading. We're going to begin right around here, because this is what interests us. We're going to look at scholarly opinions. Did the writer of Barnabas hold that Jesus' resurrection and ascension occurred in the same day or with an interval of time separating them? Many exegetes, Hilkenfeld, Volkma, Weissacke, Gebhardt, and Lake, hold that the verse implies that the resurrection and ascension took place in the same day, i.e. on a particular Sunday, a theory in direct conflict with Luke X. Now, if this is in direct conflict with Luke X, and the author very clearly was aware of the book of Acts, likely even Luke, then it very clearly is not a good scholarly opinion to hold to. Another view is that the writer believed that the resurrection and ascension took place on a Sunday, but with an interval of time separating them. This interpretation certainly gives some content to the works Kai Thane Rothais, which would then refer to the resurrection appearances mentioned in the Gospels. However, 
This view cannot be reconciled with the 40 days tradition of Acts 1-3 any more than the first theory. Various traditions as to the duration of the post-resurrection period are found in the early centuries, although eventually the Acts tradition was universally accepted and is the reason for the observance of the Feast of the Ascension on a Thursday. By the way, we think, again, we don't agree with all scholarship. We don't bow the knee to scholarship. Very clearly, the best readings are found in the biblical text. That is why, that is why the church has always held to this. And you don't find any contradictions in the early fathers. So this is important to keep in mind. Gerisostomos held that the ascension occurred on a Saturday, apparently deducing this from Acts one twelve, which speaks of a Sabbath day journey. Another tradition held that the ascension occurred on the day of Pentecost. So in the year 389, Ethereum alludes to the ascension as being observed on the afternoon of the same day on which Pentecost was celebrated in the morning. A third view is that the writer simply mentioned the resurrection appearances and the ascension as a corollary to the fact of the resurrection, much as in Luke 9.51 is used of the whole journey of Jesus to Jerusalem, which was to culminate in the ascension. On this view, the doctrine of the person of Christ tended to bring together the various aspects of God's work in redemption so that all the various historical moments, the baptism, transfiguration, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, session at God's right hand, giving of the spirit, and the parousia, stand together as the good news revealed in Christ. In the New Testament, sometimes these are conflated as in St. John's Gospel. At other times, two or three do duty for the rest. So on this view, Barnabas 59 emphasizes the resurrection and ascension as significant events in our redemption without any consideration of the chronological interval between them. There is nothing in the Greek construction of the verse to compel acceptance of theory one and two is not excluded by the construction, although the conflict with Acts 1-3 is acute on this view. It would seem that three has the greatest balance of probability in its favor. And we don't have to read much more. We don't have to go forward much more just to show that as L.W. Barnard in the in this scholarly work of the Benedictine Review, very clearly we show that the very best scholarship has no issue with the Greek text of Barnabas and it clearly shows that those other theories, they really don't make much sense at all. We hope that this has put your minds to ease. Maybe you were aware of this argument. Maybe you weren't. Now you are. Now, in case it ever does come up in the future, you're able to defend the faith and to defend the reliability of the writings of the early church fathers. In particular, those apostolic fathers that would have been taught and trained by an apostle, that would have walked and talked and preached with those that were closest to Christ, and those indeed that would have been taught directly from our Lord. We hope you've been edified. If you've been edified, do me an incredible favor. Now, there are a number of ways in which you can support me. Check the link down below. There's a link to my Patreon. It's a PayPal link as well if you want to support in that way. Consider becoming a member. If you become a member, you get a really cool, nifty picture of a church father icon that you can use every time you post on my YouTube page or every time I have a live show going on in the live chat or even in a premiere. They're really cool, incredible emojis that you're able to utilize. Uh, they come, they're actually, you don't even need to utilize them. They come attached right to your name. Consider becoming a patron. Your support is incredibly important for our ministry. The other way you can help support me, if you're already a patron, if you already help in any other way, or if it is the only way you can help, flood the comment section down below. Let us know that you enjoyed it. Tell me what you thought about the show. Tell me what you thought about the presentation. Were you edified? Flood it. I don't care if you leave two, three, four, five, or ten comments. I don't care. 
flood it for the algorithm. Our channel is blown up, not because of me, but because of you and because you are an incredible help. And we love you. God bless you. God keep you. Pray for me. I am praying for you.